Frank Sutcliffe began to photograph the Yorkshire fishing port of Whitby over a hundred years ago. Sutcliffe's camera created a rare visual record of great beauty. His most famous photograph was made in a summer's morning in 1886, and one boy, James Locker, recalled 82 years later how Sutcliffe posed the picture. And we were like in the boat, and he said, hey, stop where you are, boys. Stop where you are. Sutcliffe called this photograph the Water Rats, and the old man speaking was one of the young boys standing on the left of the boat. Now is it, I've got you. Though it all looked so natural, Sutcliffe had in fact brought the boat across the harbour, then paid the boys to pose round it. Frank Sutcliffe's view of children playing here in Whitby Harbour nearly a century ago demonstrates photography's power to show the natural appearance of people and places. But that wasn't enough for photographers like Sutcliffe. His father had been a painter, and that left Frank with an inferiority complex about the status of photography as a fine art. And the Victorians had a passion for art which bordered in lust and certainly fueled the insecurity of the photographers. So to try and achieve the status of art, they sometimes ignored the camera's unique ability to record the truth of outward appearances and went instead in pursuit of beauty. The influence of art conventions can be seen in the earliest studies of the English pioneer Fox Talbot, who called photography the royal road to drawing. In these photographs, both subject and style were borrowed straight from painting by another gentleman anxious to have photography accepted as art, Roger Fenton. The formal beauty of Fenton's landscapes owes something to his early training as a painter in Paris, where a fellow student was the French photographer Gustave Le Gray. Some of the art photographers' scenes from common life are reasonably restrained, like these portraits of English peasants by William Grundy. Oscar Rylander was typical of many failed painters who took refuge in photography and brought some dubious fashions with them. Rylander set up as a fancy dress photographer, posing models and scenes of such absurdity that he surely saw the joke himself. John the Baptist's head on a plate. A model at the foot of the studio cross. The lower orders had simple pleasures, like playing street organs. And some caught flies while others sat about inviting pity. But this problem picture as an unemployed carpenter worrying about how to feed his family. Rylander's greatest triumph was the two ways of life, a tableau made by combining 30 separate negatives. It contrasted a life of hard work on the one side with loose living on the other. The bare-breasted wantonness was achieved with the help of 25 models from Madame Wharton's Pose Plastique Troupe in Wolverhampton. Queen Victoria found the two ways of life so uplifting that she bought it for Prince Albert. But others less broad-minded thought it appalling bad taste and a prostitution of photography. The greatest faker of them all was Henry Peach Robinson, another former painter who could compose his subjects with a sense of pathos. Prince Albert was moved to place a standing order for these photo effusions, which Robinson produced two or three times a year 
often composite photographs. With this study called Bringing Home the May, we can see how separate negatives were combined to create the scene, which the artist had often sketched out in advance. Models were hired to pose as peasant girls. They were then dressed in folk costumes and photographed separately. Even shrubs in the foreground could be mocked up. The different negatives were then combined with great care, skillfully touched up, and large prints struck off for the public to buy and hang on the wall. But Robinson was accused of morbid sentiment. In this study called Fading Away, a dying girl was surrounded by her anxious family on five negatives. Sentimentality always sold well. This photograph was titled Dawn and Sunset. This old couple were captioned at the end of the day. Robinson's style found its natural level in this photo tale of Little Red Riding Hood. When the blast of the future finally hit the old-fashioned art photographers in the 1880s, it came from deepest Norfolk. Peter Henry Emerson was one of those Victorian polymaths we keep coming across in this series. A doctor of medicine, a naturalist, a writer of detective stories, and of course a keen photographer. And he was also the most ferocious critic of the fancy dress photographers and all their artistic pretensions. And although Emerson talked a good deal of nonsense himself, he did stimulate a very lively debate in which his best ally was his own photography. He took most of his pictures here. Certainly the finest and most influential of his work was done here in the Norfolk Broads. Emerson demanded respect for the camera's own way of seeing, which he called naturalistic photography. Emerson published his photographs of the Norfolk Broads in books, and the grey tones he got in his carefully produced prints were ideally suited to the misty landscape of the Broads. In the broads, the noisy theorists spent years evolving a more natural imagery. Emerson's approach to life in the broads is direct. The occasionally stilted quality is offset by the documentary content, which has, over the years, added another dimension of interest to his work.
while Emerson worked away in the remote broads, the London salons were shocked by his assault on old traditions. Emerson's attack on the precious world of art photography was said to have burst like a bombshell dropped at a tea party. But Emerson's own studies can also look rather romantic to our eyes, and they do owe something to the French artist Millet, the painter of peasants whom he much admired. Emerson advised the followers of his naturalistic style, do not call yourself an artist photographer and make artist painters and artist sculptors laugh. Call yourself a photographer and wait for artists to call you brother. One of the brother photographers admired by Emerson was the man up on the coast at Whitby, Frank Sutcliffe. But Sutcliffe had inherited from his artist father a low opinion of photography. It is a terrible thing, he said, to have been brought up with a feeling of contempt for one's handicraft. Sutcliffe's sense of inferiority must have got worse when Emerson suddenly denounced photography as the lowest of the arts and attacked his own followers as illiterate and ignorant tradesmen. Sutcliffe worked in his studio during the day, so most of his pictures had to be taken at dawn or dusk. As town photographer here in Whitby, Sutcliffe lived the life of a tradesman. He had to work long hours in his studio during the tourist season. And of course, Yorkshire didn't encourage artistic pretension. So to try and advance the claims of photography as fine art, Sutcliffe helped found a brotherhood of the leading British photographers, and they called it the linked ring. But while some of his colleagues in the ring simply followed the latest fashions in painting, Sutcliffe managed to combine a particular kind of photographic truth with beauty. The people in the pictures are gone, and the fishing industry is now almost dead. But Whitby remains, with Sutcliffe's photographs, a powerful bond between past and present. While many of Sutcliffe's photographs are posed and rather sentimental, the camera gives them an inherent realism which is now touched with melancholy. This fisher boy, James Gray, was born in 1879 and photographed when he was about 11 years of age. James went on to marry and have eight children. He was killed in the First World War.
The Whitby pictures are a unique visual record in which the vanished way of life of English fisherfolk is lyrically preserved. Sutcliffe's pictures of his beloved Whitby were much admired by the new generation of photographers who shared the belief that photography would only realize its true potential by seeing straight. Straight photography tried not to follow trends set by older art forms. In America, the fight to have photography recognized as a fine art was carried by Alfred Stieglitz. His special talent had been recognized by Emerson as far back as 1887, when Stieglitz was still just a student. There were fierce arguments in those times with the nature of straight photography and pure photography. But Stieglitz wanted photography to follow the modernist revolution, which was then sweeping through painting. One scene which fascinated him at the turn of the century was the sight of the skyscrapers, then just beginning to rise over New York. Particularly this one behind me, the Flatiron Building. Not much to look at now, but an eye catcher in 1903. Stieglitz organized exhibitions, edited magazines, and collected around him a group with a radical style. One of the group, Edward Steichen, outraged the photographic establishment, who denounced pictures like his self-portrait as fuzzy graphs.
the Americans formed a group called the Photo Secession. They had seceded from the 19th century traditions and were trying to move into the 20th century. By 1905, the group was displaying its photographs in a gallery at 291 Fifth Avenue run by Stieglitz. Alfred Stieglitz had first made his mark back in 1887 with this prize-winning picture, A Good Joke, which, though set up, contrives to look natural. This study, Paula, was made in 1889. Stieglitz summed up his contempt for derivative art photography when he said, I am not a painter, nor an artist, therefore I can see straight. His most famous straight photograph was the steerage, taken in 1907. By cutting through the tangle of old influences, Stieglitz revealed a direct view of the modern world. <laughs> Photography is my passion, Stieglitz declared, the search for truth, my obsession. And this obsession helped the Americans become the first to evolve the forms of photography, which were in the end best adapted to the rigors of the 20th century. In the next episode of Camera, The Ends of Art, Gus MacDonald shows how photography influenced painting and the greatest painters of the age. Some artists were reluctant to admit their debt to the photograph, but the evidence is undeniable.